Hello, my name is Tim Ryan. Welcome to the Tim and Jen Show. I'm sitting here with my best friend, my better half, and my co-host. Hi, I'm Jennifer Jimenez Ryan. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today. <sighs> God, I needed that. Yeah, I just needed it's that, been but... a. Uh, it's. It's been nonstop for the past 45 days. Yeah, I feel like it's been nonstop forever. Like even with COVID and the lockdown and all that stuff. And now that things are picking up, um, we've just been going. And uh, and then we had Mackenzie for eight or nine, 10 days. Yeah, too. and we were in Florida. Then we went to Chicago. Now we're in LA. Then we're doing yeah. something in Mexico tomorrow for a minute. Then we're going back to LA. Then we're in Ohio. Then we're everywhere. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah, I, I came back after being gone. We were gone for like over a month and uh, it was like back to reality. We had to do e Easter um, and then now we're back to reality and I have to pack again. And self-care, what are you doing for that? I um, am going to take some time off after we do this next 10, 12 days of tour, um, basically all across the country. Um, we're going to go back to Florida and I just need me time because I've been on survival mode for a while. However, in Florida, I started taking care of myself in a sense that I mean that I do my walks here in LA and stuff, but I started seeing people. Um, I started seeing my best friend who we're going to have on the show. Um, I started uh, getting IV infusions and stretching and it's really helped. Blood work you had. I did all, a lot. We both had our blood panels done yeah. and I have the testosterone of an 80 year old man. Outside of that, I'm good to go. But you're getting that fixed. Getting that taken care of. Um, and um, and then we were running around with Mackenzie, which was beautiful and so rewarding uh, to see how she's growing up so quickly. Five and um, a half years old, going on 15. Yeah. She's just precious. She really has a well, good heart. It, being with kids scattered throughout the country, you know, um, when COVID hit, we weren't able to see Mackenzie for a long time, but you know, we see her every month now, but that quality time in the unconditional love you give her, oh, thanks, man. It, it gets me choked up because I know she's not getting that in her home right now. Um, I'm not going to get into all that, but with you and Mackenzie, it is unconditional love. And that child absolutely adores you. And I thank you for loving Mackenzie and me the way you do. Well, I do. But. I mean, I absolutely love your kids, all your kids. And um, one of the things, you're going to make me cry. One of the things that we, I was very adamant about when Tim and I got together was that I wanted her to feel a healthy home. Yeah. And I wanted her, you know, she doesn't hear us fighting. Um, she, we celebrate her, you know, and we try to teach her words that Wait, are positive. Hold on. She doesn't see us fighting. We have disagreements. You make it sound like we fight all the time. Well, you know, I mean, like bicker fight. I mean. Who's the boss? <laughs> anyway. You are. Uh, <laughs> we, um, but we, we try to, you know celebrate her and I think about the things that um, I learned as a child all the love I got and also the things that I didn't get I tried to incorporate in with with Mackenzie um, and it's it's a blessing um, anyways I I want to say this thing though before we we introduce our amazing guest and um, I'm actually going to I'm gonna chop you there you say what you're gonna say now I'm going to read part of our guest bio without our guest name. Then you're going to introduce our guest. Okay, but I um, I love how we're sorting this out as we're doing. I change on the fly. But uh, I, I I've been we were talking earlier today, and it hit me um, once we got to LA. Uh, there's so much mental health issues happening right now in the world and i feel that people aren't really paying that much attention to it and i think it's something that we need to pay attention um with uh law enforcement's killing themselves uh not just law enforcement people grabbing kids. guns and going and shooting them you know shooting up places kids grabbing their i mean we read the story that this 11 year old went and grabbed his son, his father's gun and he knew how to work a gun he went into the gun safe and got it and then and Put it, you know, put it to his head whether he was attempting suicide he was or not. Years old, killed himself. You know, and uh, 
You know, it's just, it's important because now we're going, we're in post COVID, you know, and yet it's still happening. We knew a lot of people while we were in Florida that got COVID, you know, it's still live and well, and yet, you know, people are getting vaccinated and, and more and more people are getting vaccinated, but now it's the aftermath and we need to be very conscious of what's going on around us. Um, that's my, yeah. yeah. So I think that's a great lead in because there's so much dysfunction in the world, in the in homes right now. And, and our next guest um, is a master practitioner, addiction professional, master certified empowerment coach. She specializes in codependency, self-love, dysfunctional slash unhealthy relationships in dealing with addiction in the family. She's co-creator of the Revolutionary Family Program in Love Yourself First Empowerment School. I could talk about her bio for a lot longer, but we're just going to bring her on. Who is our guest? Our guest today is um, not only a very powerful and strong woman, but she's, um, now I'm going to cry, she's my best friend. She's like my soulmate, my twin, and um, brings out the terrible in me in a good way, and we laugh, like, uncontrollably at events when we're not supposed to. Um, she has held my hand and walked through this journey with me for the last eight years. And it's interesting, when I first met her, I went to go speak at this uh, place in Florida and her and her husband were running the place and I walk in, it's eight in the morning and I got all done up, right? And uh, I walk in there and there's a club going on basically. And like all these people who were in treatment were like, you know, dancing. And I was like, where did I just walk into? And, um, and then, you know, these people are like, I am, and they say something like, I am amazing, I am this. And I see this woman. I am dog shirt. <laughs> I see this woman in the middle of the dance floor, and it's my best friend who I'm about to introduce. And I literally had a girl crush just like that. You know, and I used to say, like, when I would thank everyone, I'd say, you know, and, and uh, you know, my girlfriend now, uh, you know, who I have a big girl crush on, and now I can say is my confidant, my tower, and just, I, I, I have nothing but amazing, badass things to say about her. Heidi McGurk, I love you. Thank you for coming on the show. Hi, Heidi. <laughs> Hi. First of all, I'm going to cry before we started because if that didn't do it, you talking about Mackenzie with Jen, and she's such a doll. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. <laughs> well, yeah. we were able Thank to you come guys to your, so much. Well, we were able to come to your house one of the days and, and spend time with your daughter and, <laughs> and Mackenzie Doug. and Doug, your yeah. husband. But that, that was a highlight of Mackenzie's trip to Florida. She was kept coming like, all She was so upset she couldn't see her again. But Aww. thank you. So what's and, going on, Heidi? How the hell is your world? Oh my gosh, my world is really good because I I do everything in my power to work at that. <laughs> like Jen was saying, like you're working, you're serving other people, you're helping other people, and then you kind of take a step back and say, okay, how can I set my world up so that I'm taking the best care of myself so that I can be even better when I go back out there? And so for me, what lights my soul are my friendships, and getting to see my friends and um, being with our daughter. We have a little six-year-old and just, you know, spending time with family. So we Easter was like that. And we just all enjoyed each other. And, and I'm back at it. Here I am. So I feel like you never stopped, though. I feel like you were, like, <laughs> were, you, you were like multitasking, doing so many different things as well as doing what you love. And, you know, and, and you're such a solid mom and wife and friend you know and i, and I don't say that in a, a business owner like i don't say that to be nice to you at all whatsoever like you are on top of the game like and one of the things like it's kind of funny because we're interviewing you but i know so much about you but what made you want to be a life coach and what is a life coach yeah, opposed to I, everything else that's where i was going before i was cut off <laughs> 15 years ago, 20 years ago, did you say, hey, I want to be a life coach? How did this blossom for you? Yeah, I always wanted to be a psychologist. Like that was my, you know, I thought that's what I was going to do for sure. And when I was in college, I got a job working in corporate America and had a, had a, had a chip on my shoulder and I had something to prove. So I dropped out of school and started climbing the corporate ladder and I became really successful in that. And that story isn't unlike a lot of people who reach the top of the ladder and they look around and they go, what the hell am I doing here? This isn't what I wanted. Yeah. I'm still unfulfilled. 
And what I realized is that all this stuff that happened on my journey that I was trying to just like pretend didn't exist and just overcome and just push through was actually the stuff that I was called and born to help people overcome. So I had a significant childhood trauma. I suffered a lot of abuse. Um, and for a long time, it was like, well, so what? You know, I was like, everybody just did the best they could. I survived. Look at me now. Look how successful I am now. But actually, when I looked around, I had a lot of money and I had a lot of things, but my relationships were a crap show. Mm -hmm. I was so dysfunctional in my intimate relationships. And that's the area, unfortunately, that a lot of our stuff shows up. You know, mm -hmm. it's in the presence of another human being and what we can't control. We can control money. It's predictable. You do the right things. You do the, th it's easy, right? It's once you master the game of how to make money. But what's not easy is when you have no control over that intimacy. And I had a lot of problems with vulnerability and sharing who I really was in that way. And so I covered up. I was binge drinking in order to fake intimacy. You know, I would have a couple of drinks and be like, oh, yeah, I'm so free, you know. Um, but it all came to a head. I actually lost the illusion of success in 2008. And I couldn't pretend anymore that I was successful. And because I was having all that money, but behind closed doors, I was still falling apart. I was drinking. I had an eating disorder. So that's when I got real. And I said, I need to heal. And I went on this healing journey and I discovered there were things I needed to repair and ways I needed to do that. And as a result, I've been coaching, but I've been coaching people in business. What I mastered, making money, running your business, you know. So I figured, you know, let me take some time away. And then once I stepped back and I was able to master that and say, okay, I feel like I love myself finally. I can really say that. Not because I look good today in the mirror. Not because the scale says I'm good today. Not because the phone rang and he called me but because in the absence of money, boyfriends, and, and a nice body, I can still sit there and say, I love myself no matter what. And then I said, I'm gonna pour, I have my mission. I'm gonna pour my heart and soul into helping people really love themselves. Because with that, like Gloria Steinem said, self-esteem is the number one predictor in your ability to get anything done in the world. Mm -hmm. I can give you all the money tips, I can teach you how to run a business, but if you have a self-sabotage mission, it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. And a self-sabotage mission comes from that unhealed trauma. You know, so that's it. I, I, I leap out of bed to make a difference. Hmm. You know, I have a mission instead of a job. I have you a purpose really instead of a career. You have a purpose, yes. Yeah. So you have yeah. a purpose and, and a gift. But there's something that you said that really kind of hit me. Like in 2008, you said, right? That you yeah. were like, I want, I need to make a change. Like, not a lot of people realize or actually have that ability of saying, I need to make that change when it's their time to get better, right? And, or improve themselves. You know, a lot of times people just know that they can't die correctly. Well, you know, I mean, if people are in addiction, for example, they're like, okay, I'm not getting high anymore. Like, or, you know, I'm still doing this, but I'm not feeling high. Like I'm feeling my feelings. But, but you said this, this, like, I need to make a change. Like, so there was something inside of you that. Needed well, I, you know, I was the type of alcoholic that I was a perfectionist in my drinking. You know what I'm saying? So I always had this, like, I would, I was the green smoothie alcoholic. You know what I mean? Like the binge drinker, I'd wake up and I go, Oh God, I feel terrible. Let me green smoothies and go to the gym and, the green and get my alcoholic. shit together. You know what I mean? I like, let me, let me get myself together and then keep up appearances put on the pencil skirt and the heels and the Louis Vuitton bag and march in and do my corporate gig and then go home, take a bunch of Ativan and Xanax, drink my face off, for, lose my shoes, mm -hmm. wake up next to the stranger yeah. and then wake up with so much shame, I'd go, oh, give me the smoothie. Now yeah. I'm really on a, you know, <laughs> now I'm on a cleanse. I'm on a master cleanse, honey, for four days. You know, I mean, that's how I used to do it. It well, was yeah. such a joke. It, it, <laughs> it's because when I've, when I first met you, Heidi, and your husband and this, I would have never in a million years, because you don't talk about it, I never knew you had a drinking problem, I never knew you had an eating disorder that you like to pop out of Anna and Xanax, and what I was trying to interrupt my wife on, because I'm good at doing that, <laughs> you were at the top of your game, you're making all the money, you had... And it, that's a lot of my story. You know, I'm, I, I made it. I had the shiny boat and the cool Harley and the white Jeep and all this money. 
but I was the loneliest person in the world because I couldn't do this. I didn't know how to ask for help, but I didn't know how to implement the changes when there was so many variables floating around me offering assistance, guidance, but I was like a horse, horse with shutters on and you revamped everything and have built a thriving business. But outside of the thriving business, what you do helps people mm -hmm. and helps families. And I want to get more into that. Um, Can you explain to people who are listening right now or watching us, what is a life coach? What is one and why do people need them? Well, <laughs> there's only so many ways you can draw a square, okay? Uh -huh. All right, therapy, coaching, consulting, mentorship, it's all the same thing. You know, I used to have a, I used to, my first job in treatment, I was under a PhD, under the psychologist. He would supervise me and the therapist, and the therapists were like, well, what's a life coach? And how are they different than a therapist? And my supervisor would be like, there's only so many ways you can draw a square. We're all helping people, right? Yeah. So I think that the difference between therapy and a coach is that with a therapist, you come in and they're a sounding board, they're a springboard, and they definitely offer feedback, but there's really no agenda, mm -hmm. you know, other than whatever comes up. Hopefully with a coach, they're taking you somewhere. Mm -hmm. The goal is to get from point A to point B. Like you go to a tennis coach, why? Because you want to get better at playing tennis. You go to a weight loss coach because you want to lose weight or get in shape. You go to a real estate coach because you want to know how to sell real estate. So there's an end game in mind other than just the pathology of I have anxiety and depression and I want to have tools to like not be so anxious and depressed, which is a great place for therapy. Coaching is more like we want to get from point A to point B. Now, there's a lot of crappy coaches. There's a lot of weekend seminar. Of, hey, I Thank went to God. Hey, I went to the weekend edition. I, I mean, I saw, you know, in my newsfeed, become a life coach for $25. I, I was like, on what planet are you going to become a life coach and, and spend $25? I mean, my program, I certify coaches. It takes them a year from soup yep. to nuts to become qualified and equipped to do what they are going to do. But I felt really good. And when they leave, I know they're not going to hurt people. You know, they're right. going to help them, right? There's a lot of people that, that have no business you know, coaching and therapists, there's a lot more therapists that are okay because they have to be credentialed and keep up their CEUs and there's a better system overseeing the therapist. There's no regulation in our industry. So it's really tough. Right. You know, I got to tell you, but to be really honest here, and a lot of people may, you know, bash me and I don't care about this, but I'm going to say my truth. There are a lot of life coaches that should never be doing what they're doing. Amen. They are, they are, they are dangerous. Yeah, you know, because they're dangerous. Really opening up wounds. They're they're yes. a sex yes. coach. They're a trauma specialist. They're a no trauma training. No, I mean it's, it's dangerous to open somebody up and not know where you're going. And also, they have these tools of like band aids on a flesh wound, like teaching the law of attraction for trauma. Or it's right. like whoa, well, it, man, yeah, it, it, scary. It, it, yeah, it's the scary. same thing with what we do. Whether it's speaking, it's interventions, it's working with the family to guide their loved one what's the appropriate care. There's so many people in our industry that should, we were talking about this the other day. I, I actually brought it up. I said, working in the treatment space is the only industry where somebody can be a year sober yeah. and make six figures to where the, the clinical director who has a, a master's and a PhD and 15 years experience makes 80,000 a year. What? I can't wrap my head around. But then you wonder on the flip side to where a lot of therapists, they might have the credentials, but a lot of them don't give a shit. Not all of them. Some are really, really good. And some I of them are if they specialize. Because right. a normal therapist is going to have, like I remember the interns that would come into where I was working at, as a coach in the treatment center, and they would say, can I sit in all your classes? And I say, sure. you're starting to be a therapist. Like, Tell me what your experience is. They said, I had one semester. And that's it. I didn't so, have anything else. Uh, no it, other training. So they got their training from, from us when they would come in and watch live and see what we were doing. And Well, that, that's interesting. cool. You know, I used to speak at some of the colleges in Chicago, DePaul and Loyola and University of Chicago, and I'd go speak to their ology classes and people that want to be a psychiatrist or a sociologist or whatever. And I'd say, look, if you want to get into this industry to help people, um, that's great, but you better be ready for a lot of death and trauma and pain and heartache because 
this isn't kumbaya. And if you're looking in this to get into this industry to make money, you're in the wrong industry. I had two people in the class get up and walk out and say, you know what, this is not what I want to do. It's what my parents want me to do. You know, you've got to, you don't just wake up one day and say, I want to be a, a speaker. I want to do interventions. I want to be a life coach. I think you, through your journeys, kind of transition into it. But I like what you're talking about, Heidi, is uh, sober coaches, sober companions, um, pure driven specialists. No, you can't go take a weekend course and now you're going to teach someone what live in recovery is. It's the same thing with what you do. You're a subject yeah. matter expert. I mean, and my all my subject matter is in one area. I mean, I in codependence, right? All of my work is around codependence, dysfunctional families, toxic relationships, toxic relationship recovery, self-love, self-esteem. I'm not a money coach and a, and a energy coach and a Reiki healer and a, you know, and, and, and 50 million other things. I, this is what I do. This is my area of expertise. So for 20 years, I've devoured and pursued with a passion because that was my area of my own healing. So mm -hmm. I've devoured all this information and learned everything I could. And then I was fascinated that it worked. And I was like, oh, I think we're onto something here, you know, and then wanted to pour it in other people. And the coaches that I certify are in the same area. So it's not like I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to certify a business coach. No, I'm going to certify people in the area of self-love and codependence. And I think specializing is the way to really end the, the so much of the challenges that we have. If we could have specialized tracks, yeah. you know, for people, even in therapy school, just a specialized tract. Okay, you're going to, but people don't know what they want to do because they don't know that, that, that their purpose in life is in their pain. Mm -hmm. So they spend Absolutely. their whole life yeah. trying to figure out what am I called to do? What am I called to do? Well, it's in the area of your growth. It's in, the, it's in your pain is your purpose. Yeah. So if you can get a handle on that stuff, running from your pain, embrace your pain and look at it and say, what, what is this about? Then you can turn it into your mission and, and make sense of it all and make it, use of it. See, that makes so much sense to me, to you. The to, way you just you. communicated it. Yeah. The way you communicated. Like, I was just going to give you, ask you an example. Like, why is it that, for example, people who are having loose weight, they're like, see, I got a handle on my life. But yet, codependency exists so deep inside of them. Or um, bad relationships, you know, toxic relationships. Why is it that we can all make all the other things shiny and pretty on the outside, but never <laughs> want to deal with the pain that's really happening? And I say this because, I used to run around and do everything else and make it all shiny and pretty, but I wouldn't deal with codependency. As you were talking, I'm like, gosh, you know, I, I dealt with codependency on another layer and another level every year, probably in the last eight years, really dug into it. And I can see it, you know. And, well, and here's what I love about that, because the truth is, you know that word because of your journey, right? And somebody's come alongside you and go, hey, Jenny, I think... Yeah. I think you might be codependent. Yeah. I think you might be, yeah. right? But but for most of us, and me too, right? People have come to me and said, hey, I think you're your adult child of an alcoholic. You have this thing. So, but most people don't know what codependence is and they don't want it. It's like catching COVID. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. I don't want the codependence. Yeah. You know, hey, I don't want to be that. Um, but all it is, all codependency really is, is when you grow up in a family dynamic that is dysfunctional in some way, alcoholic, addicted, narcissistic, absent, out to lunch, overbearing anything you hustle and scramble to try to find a way to connect thrive uh, survive thrive connect or cope in that family dynamic and essentially it's just like a way to be loved you take put on a mask and you go oh i need to please mommy to be loved oh i need to fix dad's problems i need to keep the peace oh i need to stay in control of things that's how i get love oh i need to keep my feelings to myself and not be a problem that's how i get love mm -hmm. and that's and then we we're little kids and we make all these decisions before the age of seven really mm -hmm. and then we go life is hard difficult people are untrustworthy or abandon you or whatever story we make up as a child and i am unlovable unless i do this thing yeah i put this mask on i do this thing and then we put the mask on and we own it and we don't even know it's a mask we don't know it's a mask and yeah. we're just going this is who i am i can't help it but guess what happens when it stops working and it becomes a detriment it worked once upon a time, but then it stops working. You get into these relationships and people take, take, take from you. 
you get in these one-sided situations. You, you feel like you get blindsided yet again. You know, you, you feel out of control all the time. You know, you, you feel like you want to share your feelings, but you want to tell them you love them, but you just don't. You mm -hmm. know, you have all these things. Yeah. And then you go, I think, I think something might be off here. That's yeah. codependence. So yeah. when I met Jen and- I love how you in, did in, that. In we, <laughs> but we fell in love and all this. She helped me tremendously, and I think it's because of what you've taught her and what she's learned is to say no, because I was a codependent. Um, I got to pay for this. I got to take care of this with this kid, this kid, this ex-wife. This I, And she said, you got to learn to have boundaries, Tim. You got to learn to say no. When are you going to put – you're the one now that is eight and a half years sober. When are you going to put yourself first instead of everybody else? And then it transitioned into my nonprofit and this, and you got to learn to shut the phone off at night. You, you don't need to answer the phone at three in the morning. And you've helped me tremendously. Um, and she, she suggested a really cool thing is you ought to see a therapist. And I'm telling you, my, my therapist, John, is, is the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. Because I, awesome. I did a little, but the relationship I have, and he's like, no, you don't need to see me every week or two. Me, send me a text when you need to talk and we'll set an appointment. And it works. But I, I think that, you know, it's funny because I was listening to your whole, what you're saying right now, Heidi, and like, I would go and I speak, right? And then you and I, it was so funny how like we BK started hanging out. We were like, we should hang out. We should hang out. Like, and it was so, I was such like a total door. We were person. so weird. I mean, we in the beginning, so, we were like, what do you mean? It was you like guys a, are both weird. There was like a seventh grade. Like, yeah. I, I like you. Do you I like, like you. me? Like, do you want to, was... we were in the DJ booth, right? And she's like, so do you want to maybe go out like I won't like maybe we should, and I was like I'd love to and then I was like I'm a good texter she's like okay like, like we were so weird so finally we exchanged numbers and I'm like she invited me over and I was like oh I gotta ask girls like her and yeah, it's like it's a, like it's a fifth grade like yes, sleepover I, I mean know. seriously yeah and like and it's hard because you know being a woman being a strong woman we're both strong you know we both like and it's like you're my mirror right and uh and my twin and uh and so i i remember i'd go and i'd speak and and i'd go to your house the first night or the first time when we hung out and uh and you say to me you know you're not fully recovered and i was like what like i'm in recovery what are you talking about and i remember 2018 right it happened three years ago major like shift in my life. Like one of, you know, those aha moments, it's one of those. And, uh, and I got, you know, lost uh, an ax and, and uh, thank God. And, and, and the job no longer served me. I wasn't growing and it ended. And I was just like balls of the wall free. And you were like, now you're in rec you're fully recovered. And I was just so excited yeah. because there's so much that happened and I'm not getting all that, you know, people who are listening may not know all the details, but I will get into details on another time. But it was this shift that happened in my life because the things that used to serve me no longer were serving me. And even therapy at that point, like, you know, I can go in there and talk about my childhood stuff or talk about moments that were happening at this moment. I just knew that I needed another another level i needed another shift i needed another guidance and i needed to like believe more in myself on, on these right. other things i, I mean for all like, the things we know we don't know it until we demonstrate it in our walk in our waking life and it's no longer serving you but you're still holding on to it and the minute you let it go you're that's it okay. that's okay. the whole thing heidi yeah. i want i want to ask you a question here then why do people stay in dysfunctional and unhealthy relationships for so long. Why do they stay in them? There's a couple of reasons they stay in. The main reason, actually the number one reason, is that they don't know they're in one. So if you talk to somebody about their relationship, they won't say toxic or dysfunctional until it gets really bad and somebody's like really hurting. They'll say things like, he's just so selfish. Hmm. I'm just with somebody and he gets mean sometimes. He's just complicated. You know, it's just so difficult. I, it's just, we don't, we just have terrible communication. It's just that he's afraid to commit to me. So he's just, you know, he's, he just, it's just that she has major trust issues. You know, it's all these things that we say that we think are normal. Cause again, dysfunction and uh, uh, codependency is a way to function in dysfunction. Mm. It's a way to be normal in abnormal situations. It's not mm. normal to be with somebody who doesn't trust you after 10 years. It's not normal to be in a situation with somebody where you're always being saying yes when you want to say no. It's not normal to be with somebody who's self-obsessed. 
Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's toxic and dysfunctional. Yeah. Uh, so we have to first get what's normal. And, and a lot of people who grow up in toxic or unhealthy dynamics think what they experience is normal. So they always are guessing at what normal is. And they'll call their girlfriends. Is this normal? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what happened. Is this, do people do this? They, they really don't know. Wow. So I feel like education is such an important part. And then the other reason they stay in is because they don't understand the secondary payoff that they're getting from it. You know, a lot of people are getting a reward for being in that relationship, even when it's bad. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have to start over. I don't, and they have to get honest with themselves about. I don't about, want to be alone. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I, I, so. I, I, I talked to a friend of mine today, and after 20 years of being with her husband, she finally has, has said, I've left him. I can't do it anymore due to his addiction and in and out of jail. And I commended her. I said, this should have happened 10 years ago. She said, it just finally got to a point where enough is enough and I need to take care of myself. And I, I look at some of the things I stayed in for so long and I don't blame it on my addiction. It's like, I just lived in the uncomfortable and, and unnormal because it was easier. I, I don't know. I've seen some really powerful moments though with you, Tim, when you come to your full truth and you're like this and that, no, I wish I'd never did that or whatever it is that's happening. When you tell your truth to somebody, like, and I mean, not you in right, general, right, right, right. when you say like, I am not you again, I'm not you. Like I've done this because I didn't want to be alone or like, yeah. I thought, you know, like I was in a, my last relationship, God bless the guy. Like, it was like more of like a, a child, you know, adult, you know, person. And I allowed that to happen. Like, but then I go back and I'm like, why did I waste five years of my five, five, I can't get back. Why do we go that far? Why do we go to the length that right, we go right, to? Right, right. And, and yes, I get it to learn the lesson, right? At the ultimate. But why do we have to, why do people have to go that far? Why do you have to hang on? Like, why do you have to have a gun in your head to finally go, maybe this guy's not the right guy, you know, that didn't well, like happen to me. Because we inter are. well, because we internalize their behavior. So my Angela said, when people show you who they are, believe them, right? Yeah. When people show you who they are, believe them. We don't do that. So if I'm with somebody that I say, oh my gosh, they're childish or they're self-centered or they're whatever, instead of looking at that person objectively, like a dog barks and the sun is bright, mm -hmm. I don't go, oh, Joey's an asshole. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can swear, right? I can swear. Yeah, yeah. Sure. totally. Yeah, yeah, okay. Instead I go, what's wrong with me that yep. Joey's being an asshole? Okay, mm -hmm. so I internalize behavior. And once I do that and make somebody else's behavior about me, now the hustle for love is on. Ooh. And I double down on the hustle. If I behave this way, they'll act better to me or nicer. If I do this, they'll stay. They'll stop treating me this way. They must be treating me this way because I'm defective. Yep. I'll change. Instead of just seeing people for who they really are. Because yeah. we, we, want, we don't want to be wrong. We want to see what we saw when we first started dating this person and our, you know, synapse were firing and we were like, yeah. woo, you know, the chemistry was happening. And that's not, that's attraction. I feel that 10 times a day. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. see somebody go, oh, hey, you know, that's normal and natural, but we call it love instead. And love is not a feeling, it's a verb. Mm -hmm. So we get into the relationship and we confuse love with the chemistry or the attraction. And then we say, well, they're not loving me. Oh, mm -hmm. but they love me. No, you had attraction for this person. Love is a verb. Are they demonstrating it or not? Yeah. You know? So it's helping people break through the denial and stop internalizing people's behavior and making it about them. Also, people blame actually a lot of things on addiction. Well, when this person's sober, they're going to be different. Hmm. Um, if they're in relationships with addicts or alcoholics, and I'm going to tell you, you know, abuse has nothing to do with addiction. They're separate things. And somebody yeah. who's abusive does that without substances. They don't need substances to abuse people. It's about power and control, right? So people will hang on thinking if they just get sober, my life is going to change. And sometimes they do get sober and nothing changes. Mm -hmm. Other or than there's just no alcohol. Get, sometimes yeah. they get sober and realize. It's wrong. They don't yeah. want each other. Or yeah. that they're, why am I even in this relationship, you know? And, and they, sometimes if people are really honest, the spouse is afraid of that happening, so they help them stay sick. Bingo. That's you just hit the nail on the head. I can't tell you how many families, uh, Always. husband, wife, or with their kids. I had a, a kid I put into uh, treatment three years ago, 
and the mother, I swear, his first day in detox, called the treatment center over 25 times and they said, Tim, you've got to call. And I, well, I got to make sure he's okay. I said, no, you're the one that's kept your son sick. Yeah. And ultimately, three, four weeks in, the kid said, look, I'm not going home. I want to stay. I want to continue. And I want to find a sober living here because my mother kept me high for the past 10 years. And yeah. and then and then there are people that get sober, right? You know, and you're like, it's gonna change things. Or maybe you, you're the one that did bad things, you know, or like kind of, cause you were out, you know, sure. checked out. And then all of a sudden you're in a relationship and uh, you realize that you're getting better, but the person you're with isn't. So they start doing fucked up shit. Yep to get reactions from you. And they go, oh my God, that's love. See, I'm getting a reaction. Yep. So then I'll, you know, I'll wipe out their bank account and clean out their house. Yep. Oh, okay, I got a reaction. I just did that, you know? Like, and you're just like, Or what? I'm gonna say I'm gonna kill myself and, and, and threaten and never do it. Yeah, yeah, and you're looking for reactions from people. And instead of being like, hey, let's have a communicative relationship. How do you feel about this? Do you wanna eat steak or right. do you wanna eat? Like, I mean, it's simple. It's like- I mean, how toxic and dysfunctional is that? I'm gonna wipe out your bank account. I'm gonna threaten suicide and we go, how can I make this work? Yeah, how do I make it better? I gotta save this person wow. and my marriage. Yeah. A tiger never changes its stripes. So I was told after wow. my last relationship. I love Heidi's. <laughs> I love when you do that. Right? I love you. Um, I, I love you on every level. So I remember I'm driving, I'm going, I flew to uh, Arizona. The driver's flying me back to the airport. She's He's a girl. flying you back to the no, airport? The, the driving driver's me, driving, driving me Driving me back airport. to the airport. And I was like, oh my God. And I was in the three months. I remember when I cried every day. And I was like crying in that three months. And she's like driving. She's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, my heart hurts. It broke my heart. And she's like, can I tell you something? I was like, Sure, anything you want. Like, you know, crying and start. She goes, take them for face value. And I was like, what? Like, I literally sobbed. And she's like, take, when you meet people, take them for face value and don't, and you'll never get it twisted again. Right. And I was like, damn, that was deep. Like, do you it, know what happens? So that's exactly right. So, like, part of the walk back home to people's sanity is learning how to embrace your intuition and hearing your intuition because i think what happens for a lot of us is we do have that we have that internal barometer but if we're in a toxic or unhealthy relationship we've been gaslighted for so long well you're crazy i never said that mm -hmm. or you misunderstood that or you didn't hear that right i didn't say it that way or if you wouldn't have done that you would have made me do that you know all of these things that gaslighting is that we start to question our own sanity we go well, maybe i am didn't hear that right you know, so it really is about getting back home, comfortable in your own body, in your own skin, hearing your own divine wisdom, your own intuition that just knows. Because we can walk, we can all, everybody has walked into a thrift store, okay, at some point and go, oh, hell no, don't touch that sweater. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you've had the energy, really. like, oh, hell no, right? Yeah. Everybody has, okay? Yeah. Let's get out of here. This isn't a good one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, if you can do that at a thrift store, you can do that with a per human being. You know what I'm saying? So we do have that, but we don't interpret it that way. We interpret that, oh, hell no, as like, oh, I'm getting charged up here. Mm -hmm. I'm getting fired up. And we confuse those red flags for chemistry. Yeah. We literally like conflate the two things. And we're like, I'm getting excited. Well, a lot of we people misread like it. A lot of people like to play the victim too. And they love to stay in victim mentality or victim mode. They like speaking victimese. Yeah, you know the the. To me, it, it's like you know you're talking. I gotta about, use that one, Jenny. That's really good. Victimese. But I mean, how many people are really willing to put in the work to change? And I mean, have you ever had a a potential client or a client you sign up saying, "Shit, I don't know," and then they totally do a 180, and and you're like, "Wow, that's amazing." The change had happened. So I can tell you by the time my clients come to me, usually like well, how the way things are this day and age, it's not like somebody watch it, like sees an ad and clicks on it. Now people check you out for a long time. Mm -hmm. They see something and then they watch your videos and they get to know you. So by the time somebody comes to me, they've watched my YouTube. They've watched every video. They binge watched. They tell me things I forgot I said. <laughs> so they're ready. They're ready. Okay. Right. But they can be in the victimese, speaking victimese, you know, when they're coming in and not realizing it. And what I've learned is I used to take this life coachy approach of wanting them to assume responsibility and shift that and help them really see. But what I've come to learn is people that are in that victim mode 
are truly, usually, almost always, once upon a time, a true victim that does not know or own the victimization, so it's repressed, and it comes out in circumstances that don't, that aren't a true victimization. That they don't even recognize why they're playing the victim, because once upon a time they were and abandoned that and said, I don't want to be the victim. I'll never be the victim. And they don't even realize they're playing the victim. So I find walking them back to that original kind of story and listening to them and actually, believe it or not, validating some of that. I hear you. That must be really hard. I get it. And genuinely, authentically, once they're validated, sometimes they can release it a little bit, a little bit at a time, release it, and you can break through. Now, there are treatment-resistant people right? The only people that were never going to really change and that you really can't help are bona fide malignant narcissists, not narcissistic type style, a true pathological narcissist. And you don't, they don't go into treatment unless right. they're forced and somebody threatens them. And usually then they're just in treatment to prove everybody wrong, that they're, they're not nothing wrong with them. So, you know, otherwise I think, I think we can help people make some movement. We just have to know where, what they need. Right. So wait, I'm dying to know, and I'm not asking like who or what, but like, have you worked with people and you're like, wow, this is a straight up narcissist. There's no helping. I've come to decisions in my own personal life with narcissists. Like, you know, that, okay, they're not going to, now I don't work with them. I choose not to because and that's why I have a complimentary consultation. Mm-hmm. So I take about 30 minutes. Okay. I say, let me see. Do I, do I like this person? I'm not desperate for business. I don't need everybody to buy my coaching. I don't want right. everybody to, I want to make a mutual interview. I, I want to be, look forward to working with my people. Like I can't wait. Oh gosh, I have Tim today. Yeah. Great. yeah. I can't wait. You know, like that's how I want to be with my people. Cause they feel that. And they that's know, a, you know, right? that's the way it should be, Heidi, because and, and you've got me thinking about what we do and we never know what we're walking into. Right. You know, speaking events are different, but you're walking in to do an intervention. You got a really cool family and a, a great person to work with or you have fucking Satan and you're trying to do <laughs> your damnedest and you're like, I'm just I just want to get out of here. I mean, this is I, I'm beating my head against the wall. But you're rare, Heidi. You're rare, and I say this in this in, in with all due respect. You're an extremely gorgeous woman, and you're powerful, which could be very intimidating to women. But you're not intimidating. You actually make people feel comfortable, Absolutely. and you make women want to be better, their better self. Right? First, I'm sure they want to be like you, but then uh, they realize that you have your best friend who is like you. Uh, <laughs> We're already all stocked up here. Who's yeah. codependent on you? <laughs> no, but. I made a joke, guys, whoever's yeah. listening. But, you know, you're you're beautiful, right? And, like, you make women want to be stronger. You make, make men want to get out of their, like, you know, thing. And, like, they get a, you're an attractive woman. And you're a 10, right? You're a 10 plus plus. But oh, so you actually make people see their reality, right? And, like, you make them stronger. You empower them. And, and you empower them. I don't understand why we're not using more life coaches and why we're not, we don't have you all over the world right now. I mean, all over the country at least. Well, because I think, I think they get a bad rap. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. I think that, thank, first of all, thank you for that. That's very, that's That's very, very kind. I I think part of the reason it doesn't come off the way is I don't really feel that way. You know what I mean? Like somebody walks in a room, they're like, Oh yeah, I'm here. You know what I mean? I don't feel that. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, I'm here. Let's check it out. Um, so, but I think that the reason that life coaches get such a bad rap, okay, and they aren't everywhere is because it's kind of like, you know, the difference between somebody who's got the latest Instagram hmm. hat and, and fad and whatever, because it's a popularity contest and they want to be, they want to rise to the top, right? They want to be the next best thing. They want to be the next Rachel Hollis. And even Rachel Hollis, now we see is taking a fall because pride becomes before a fall, right? Like I'm all about me and watch me go and da da da. Well, I think Jesus said it, but pride comes before a fall, right? So, I mean, it's ancient wisdom that we can all apply. Like, you know, I, I think that 
what I don't have is a coaching practice. I have a ministry. I'm not a minister, but I have a ministry, right? I'm going to minister to your heart. I want to minister to you, to your soul, to your potential, to your beauty, to your perfection. And, and that's a calling. It's not about me. Mm -hmm. And I Amen. think when it doesn't come about you anymore, you're going to, you're going to be able to make an impact in the world. But as long as it's about you, look at my stuff, look at my latest thing, look what I've done. You've got it. They got it all wrong. It can never be about you. It's not supposed to be about you, right? They're with people in their lives that their, their toxic relationships are all about the people they're with. Yeah. So you, you just take the place of the last toxic person. It's not all about you. And I'm your coach and I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to, I believe as a coach, you have the answers. I just want to help you find them inside. Yeah. Cut through all the noise, right? Yeah. So you spot them. You see the ones that are up and trying to climb and hustle and get up there and be seen and do whatever. I don't care if I, if nobody sees me, if one right person does yeah. that, Amen. that says, Hey, I needed you today. Thank you. Well, and, it, and I get those messages and you know what? I don't care about the rest. I well, really it, don't. I yeah. when we were with you, you had brought up analogy, an analogy of someone you know, climbing up on your back while I'm sitting on a chair and stabbing me with a knife, trying to climb over me to get to the top. And, and we see in, in our industries, people like that all the time. They last about two years and they fade away because people catch on to their bullshit real quick. I mean, the thing about me is you can call, I'm the same person everywhere, whether I'm speaking to 1200 doctors, a college, a pro football team, or I'm speaking in a prison. I speak the same. I talk to everyone the same. I treat everybody the same. If you want my help, great. If not, I'll guide and direct you to somebody else that can help you. It's as simple as that. There is no hidden agenda, but so many people out there have got them and it's, it's just. But I love that you see it that way because yeah. no one sees it that way. Not on, okay, I'm not gonna say no one. A lot of people don't see it that way. I think and it's I, hard to see it that way in our society. It really is. Because we reward, reward. Yeah, we, we, we as a society propel the image of status. Now I think COVID kind of burst a little bit of that bubble, right? With renting the private planes and renting the car and taking the picture up front. And we all know you're eating ramen and what are you doing? Yeah, right. And, yeah, yeah. and, and getting the, you know, so the real is what we want, but you know, you can be real and be a real asshole, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not just about authenticity. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the ticket. And I tell my coaches that I say, this ain't about you. Okay. And it never will be. And if you need it to be, you're not going to be successful. If, if you could, if you have a ministry, if you have a mission, if you have a calling and you wake up in the morning to make a difference in the life of another human being, that will shine through. And you know what will happen? Your clients will give you the accolades. The people will come to you and say, you changed me. Thank yeah. you. And you'll give it right back and you'll say, you changed you. Yeah. Right? I was just there. But, but it, it, that's an old Taoist philosophy too, is that if you just give it over to the people and give them all the credit, they naturally will say, well, it, it, you help me. And, and, and not even if you want that or not, it's irrelevant. It'll come to you. You I won't like, have to claw your way to get right. it. But yeah. I like what you said earlier. You said, it's already inside of the person. I just kind of go through the cobwebs and throw this out and I help to make it flourish. And I water that, that seed with inside of you to watch it grow. It's all there. I just guide and direct you. And that's what I really we, like connect the dots like yeah. for people. So do you know, beautiful mind? I love that movie. That's my personality, right? Without, I'm like the, I'm like the nutty professor in a right. little case. And <laughs> when I work with somebody, yeah. it's like a science. So when I sit with them, it's like a little movie screen of their life plays behind them and all the little particles of their life flip forward, why they are the way they are, how they came to this conclusion, when, when and where the beliefs were formed. And it's just like a puzzle and they just come together. And like the sacred wisdom says, know yourself is step one. A lot of people don't know themselves really. They know who they think they are, but they're not who they are. They're who they needed to be. Yeah. So we, Ooh. we connect the say dots. That again. Right? Say that again. Say yeah. that again. Most people think they know who they are, but they're not who they are. They're who they've needed to be. Wow. So we, we, we remove all that and then we work on the rest. So it's like, it's like the great connector. I'm going to connect all the dots for people. That's and once you have the puzzle, you can't go back. 
you know, because you're, yeah. you're no. together. Yeah. I like it. I'm in awe and I feel like I really do hope that people are listening right now, like hearing this and listening because it is literally the music of the heart. It is like Aww. being in church right now because people need to feel empowered. Like just hearing you right now is allowing me to feel more empowered, you know, and, and it's true though what you're saying. Um, are you finding more women or men are in the codependent? Well, just as many. I think it's I think it's an equal opportunity situation. Um, I have equal men and women in my practice, um, so I, I'm not noticing more. You know, typically in the past it would be we would only, you know, just market to women, and because women were the ones that would do the self help, and the men wouldn't. And that's such an archaic way of looking at it. But I think that men are really at a disadvantage today. I know, you know, hey, women, it's our, it's our time, and, and, but there's a lot of men that are extremely codependent right now, walking on eggshells, not knowing what to say, what not to say, who to be, who not to be, and that's all codependency. And so, you know, helping them find their voice and their power in all of this while the woman is so, because we can be powerful and reign together. We don't need to suppress mm -hmm. in order to rise up. We can, we can, you know, rising tide floats all boats. Let's lift together. We don't have to oppress one to raise another. That's not, it's a tide very old, I love that. that's a very old way of looking at things that I've got to suppress to rise. It's just, you don't, we can all rise. You know? Women, I've noticed that a lot of women tend to go, oh, okay, I'm going to let him rise and I'll just sit back a little bit. No, nah, girl, like you rise with him. Like, you yeah. know, one of the things I loved about Tim was that he was like, let's do this together. I'll never let you get less than I get. Like, and I was like, what? Like, and, and cause I was getting offered a lot less in things in life because I'm a woman. And so like, right. he's like, no, I'm going to like, sh let we you do shine. everything together, man. And, That's the way it rolls. And it's amazing. But not a lot of men are like that because they feel threatened. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's well. A yeah, I think, I think that. I think that you know, their men are losing their footing, right? They don't know how to be supportive because traditionally, their role was to support the woman. Like that's how they would say, "I'm doing well." Their measure of success. But now women don't need men's money. We're not. We're not okay? in the fifties and sixties anymore. No. Where you know, dad comes home from work and you've got my martini and my slippers, and I sit in my chair and I smoke, and you have dinner, and I have another drink, and I say hi to the kids. Those days are over, you know. Um, but I, you really hit on something because I've made a lot of these changes. <clears throat> all of them since you came into my life, my wife, Jennifer, and obviously you, Heidi, because I take a lot of your guidance and direction when we're eating meals. And I, I listen to everything you and your husband say, and I compartmentalize and take what I need. But I really, for the men listening to this right now, I mean, I would say out of every 10 men, seven probably could use uh, your services. Yeah. I really believe that. Um, because a lot of men, due to their egos or their being stubborn, I don't need any help. I'm not codependent. But I look back on my life, I was the most codependent person there was. And it almost destroyed me to where I wanted to, to put a gun in my mouth or, or I was going to pick up and use again. Because I didn't know how to ask for help. I had the money to pay for a life coach, whatever. I just didn't ever do it. So a lot of men, Tim, are like rogue heroes, right? They have this desire in their hearts to save and to help and to fix. And it's such a pure motive, right? If we just take it up, like I want to serve and I want to, I want to make a difference. But what happens is they pick women that are <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> need rescued, yeah. you know, yeah. and and then it's it's fruitless and it's it's like this vicious cycle. And so we learn how to channel that energy yeah. and find a partner instead I of a, a project. I'm done right. rescuing. Right, me. you have like, a partner instead of a project, and that's what we want. Ooh. And now you can do this in your work. You well, get yeah. to do it in your work, not in a personal life. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up and I'll well, let you go. Let like, I have never been so happy in my life. It, it's 52 mm -hmm. years old. I didn't. I wasn't looking for love again and all this, but I wouldn't change a thing. And the only regret I have is where the fuck were you 30 <laughs> years ago? You know, we're Get probably, high. we're probably <laughs> both <laughs> dead. Milan, but, Paris, yeah. Italy, yeah. you know, um, red carpets. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Unavailable, brother. Yeah. <laughs> That's another podcast. But you know what's crazy uh, with what you just said? It's not crazy is, because I have women and I had you in my life and I've had so much self-help, I've had, I've done so much work on myself that when I met Tim, that was the last thing I wanted was a relationship. 
because I had found myself yet again on a new level. But I, I said to him, I don't need you. Just know that. I choose right. you. I don't need you. I need no man to, to take care of me. I, I, I don't need that. So I think there was like, I think you were in shock at first, but like then there yeah, was I'm like, this, hey, this like, is great. But that then sounds I, good for a change. But You're buying dinner? Awesome. I've also realized, you know, having done a lot of work on in such a deep level that there's also times where he needs his his opportunity to grow, you know, without me trying to go, go there, do this, you're going to be better. Like, and so it's been such a blessing to see this, you know, and see this change. Well, um, we want to come full circle guys. Like I'll, I can, you know, leave you with this, like this full circle thing is this, this first thing is, you know, dependence where we're completely dependent upon each other and we can't live without each other, oxygen and that's unhealthy, right? Too much independence. I'm me and you're you and fuck that and I don't need you and you don't need me, right? Too much of that is also, mm -hmm. you know, not the best thing, right? So it's a balance. It's this interdependence. It's, it's okay to need each other and we contribute in ways that are complementary, like the bees and the, and the flowers, right? We're both bringing something and we're contributing to each other's lives and this interdependence is what makes things flow. So when one person is too independent and another person is too independent, it creates this like yeah. chasm between us. We're too dependent. We're smothered and meshed. We yep. don't have any oxygen, you know? Yep, yep. So it's a balance. It's a dance. I, um, I'm honored to have you in my life. Well, I, I love you. I call you my best friend. I love um, you. I, I have never laughed harder with another female in my life um, and um, yet been able to be raw and open and honest on and cry and, and be not nice and be all these things with you. I, I'll tell you've loved me unconditionally through it. I, all. Do. I, do. I, I will tell you this two weeks prior to any trip going to Florida and we used to go a lot. Uh, I got to get a hold of Heidi and Doug. We need to get them on the schedule. That's the only thing she gives a shit Yep. about making sure we have locked in is seeing you every oh, time we go to Florida. This last time we didn't see anybody. No. We saw you. That's it. Yeah. You know, but uh, Heidi, how can people that are listening, if they're, they want to find you, they want to research you, they want to book you, how do they find you? How do people reach out to you? Everything is over at lovecoachheidi.com. Really easy. Even if they go to the blog and they want to, just go on YouTube and start going on the binge watch, you know, on some of those videos. It's love coach Heidi over there. Um, I have a, we're having like a lot of missions they can see over there. I've written a children's book for adults to explain codependence in a really simple way. We're donating these to drug and alcohol treatment centers. Awesome. Um, they can book a session. They can just check me out, you know, get to know me. We can start to date each other a little bit, you know, in this relationship. Uh, so yeah, lovecoachheidi.com. Everything they need is there. Good. So will you come back over and over and over again? I'll come back show? anytime. Yeah. yeah we could do like a hot seat couple. Oh my God, person. Oh, that'd, that'd be, be great. That would be, that'd awesome. be awesome. We'll put Jen in the hot seat. Um, again, <laughs> let's do that. Love Coach Heidi for people that are also have might have a family member, a loved one struggling with substance abuse or mental health. You can reach out to us at dope to hope dot dope to hope.com or 844-611-HOPE, 844-611-4673. That rings to my personal cell phone. Again, Heidi, we want to thank you for coming thank you on so the much. Tim show. I just saw that it was time and I was like, damn it. Like I want it so went by much. So quick. I went by. This is a, like fastest interview ever that we've had. Um, you are amazing on every level. Thank you for showing women that, you know, we could be strong and we can own who we really are and, and allowing me to be authentic and real. Always with you. You're, um, you're divine. You're amazing. I love you so much. I love both of you. We've adopted Tim. I know. Uh, Thank just you, the Heidi. Same. We love yeah. Doc so much. We really love Heidi. you. Heidi. I, wait, let me finish. Uh, anyone out there right now that's listening to this or watching this, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for listening and allowing us to have this platform and to, um, and I just hope you're having a, you're, you're okay in your own skin at this right moment. And, um, and uh, Candice and Chelsea, thank you so much. Lux Media, we love you guys. And please check in with us next week. Yeah. And for the people that are listening on Spotify or Apple iTunes or all, Amazon. The, all the platforms out there, if you actually want to watch the show, go to your app store in your your phone and download l u x e tv lux tv and you can watch any one of our podcasts 
Heidi, we want to thank you. you so Jen, much. I love you. This is Tim you, and Heidi. Jen signing off for the Tim and Jen Show. Have an amazing week. Love Later. Thank you. Thank you. We want to talk to you about Clean Cause, Better Caffeine. What's in the can? Our organic sparkling Herba Mate is a premium pick-me-up that won't let you down. Every can of Clean Cause contains 160 milligrams of Better Caffeine. And each sip supports recovery from alcohol and drug addiction. 50% of the profits go to assist people into sober living. Check out cleancause.com. Hope at Rosecrans. It's more than a wish. Hope has power. As the proven behavioral health leader in the Midwest, no other program offers our depth of experience and hope here at Rosecrans. And when someone you love struggles with substance abuse and mental illness, hope plays an important part in recovery. Life's got bigger plans for you. We should know. We're the most trusted name in treatment and the best choice for those who dare to hope. Visit us at rosecrans.org. Life's waiting. Seaside Palm Beach is an executive luxury addiction treatment center located in Palm Beach, Florida. Our private clients come from all over the world, including business executives, professional athletes, celebrities, and more. Seaside Palm Beach offers first-class amenities and high-end accommodations, including a gourmet culinary experience, ocean views, pet-friendly facilities, and access to cell phones and laptops during your stay. If you or a loved one are struggling with addiction, please call us at 877-959-5053. Again, that number is 877-959-5053. Now, glutathione is a big word, but it's the body's own master antioxidant. Oh, it's a scavenger for free radicals, for bacteria, and what's relevant now, viruses. This is new to the marketplace. There's no other product on the market that has the ingredient NASET. And basically NASET increases the production of that glutathione that is in our body already to strengthen and, and enhance our, our immune system and keep it strong. Elevated sense of well-being. Supports muscle strength and endurance. Cognitive function. Powerful liver support. energy, helps blood sugar regulation, superior bioavailability of key ingredients. One of your best defenses against COVID mm -hmm. is a strong immune system. Taking GSH Plus as a daily supplement does all that. Now we have the product out on the marketplace.